Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Jurassic Park, the best-selling novel by Michael Crichton. I picked this up for a video that I'm doing with Susie over on Lord Literature and Madam Media, so you can go and check that out on that channel. Uh, basically, we did a TBR swap, so I read Solus by Gail Carriger, which was on her TBR, and she read Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton, which was on my TBR. So we did a video where we both read both books and compared notes. But this will just be me doing my regular review. I'm going to start by reading the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I will share overall thoughts and rating at the end. On a remote jungle island, genetic engineers have created a dinosaur game park. Drawing on all his best-selling talent and scientific brilliance, Michael Crichton has, in Jurassic Park, written the most electrifying techno filler of our time. So, I wanted to start with, in the introduction, uh, which is talking about the, one of the key companies. Uh, it says, in this commercial climate, it is probably inevitable that a company as ambitious as International Genetic Technologies Inc. of Palo Alto would arise. And I just think that's a nice little detail because Palo Alto is like, that's where like Google and stuff are headquartered now. So that's still relevant as like where somewhere like this would be headquartered, you know? So I thought this was an interesting little bit of character building here about Dr. Grant. Uh, but Grant knew that paleontology, the study of extinct life, had in recent years taken on an unexpected relevance to the modern world. The modern world was changing fast, and urgent questions about the weather, deforestry, deforestation, global warming, or the ozone layer are often seemed answerable, at least in part, with information from the past, information that paleontologists could provide. He had been called as an expert witness twice in the past few years. I thought it was interesting as well, they uh, measure time in cases. So they're like, oh, we've been up here 40 cases, which is 40 cases of beer. So that's how they like keep track of how much time has passed. I think this is interesting. I, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I assume it is true. Uh, most rediscovered animals were rather recent additions to the fossil record, 10 or 20,000 years old. Some were a few million years old. In the case of the coelacanth, 65 million years old. But the specimen they were looking at was much, much older than that. Dinosaurs had died out in the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago. They had flourished as the dominant life form on the planet in the Jurassic 190 million years ago and they first appeared in the Triassic roughly 220 million years ago. And they're talking about this uh, program called CAST where they can like excavate skeletons and without digging them up basically they can get a really good 3D image so um, it says you could get a perfect image of the bones in three dimensions and it promised a whole new era of archaeology without excavation but none of that happened yet. And I don't think it's happened now like I think people would still dig up the bones. There's this great little um, interchange here. When Ellie shook hands, Gennaro said in surprise, you're a woman. These things happen. And then Malcolm, he has this great quote here. Malcolm, uh, I don't know, especially in this instance, I could highly relate to him. So, but don't you find it boring to wear only two colours? Not at all. I find it liberating. I believe my life has value and I don't want to waste it thinking about clothing, Malcolm said. I don't want to think about what I will wear in the morning. Truly, can you imagine anything more boring than fashion? Professional sports, perhaps. Grown men swatting little balls while the rest of the world pays money to applaud. But on the whole, I find fashion even more tedious than sports. So it has some cool parts in it as well, which I'm not sure how it translated in the audiobook. So like genomes and stuff. And there are like information charts. Here, that this is interesting. Uh, oh, come on, Nedry said. Nobody could be analysing a DNA molecule. He knew biologists were talking about the Human Genome Project to analyse a complete human DNA strand. Well, that would take 10 years of coordinated effort involving laboratories around the world. It was an enormous undertaking, as big as the Manhattan Project, which made the atomic bomb. That's been successful for, you know, I mean, it can be completed in our lifetimes anyway, but... So again, this is something that I found interesting. And one thing I did notice that was that a lot of the things I was tabbing out was like sciencey stuff that I thought was cool, as opposed to maybe the plot, uh, which is a bit of a slow burner, but uh, reptile eggs contain large amount of yolk, but no water at all. The embryos must extract water from the surrounding environment, hence the mist. Again, I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, it's fascinating. And then a guy called Wu, uh, who works on the team, he's talking about how they've like en genetically engineered the dinosaurs so that they can't survive if they breach the island, theoretically at least. Because I've made sure that's precisely what will occur, Wu said, finally showing a trace of irritation. Look, we're not fools. We understand these are prehistoric animals. They're part of a vanished ecology, a complex web of life that became extinct millions of years ago. They might have no predators in the contemporary world, no checks on their growth. We don't want them to, we don't want them to survive in the wild. So I've made them lysine dependent. I inserted a gene that makes a single faulty enzyme in protein metabolism. As a result, the animals cannot manufacture the amino acid lysine. They must ingest it from the outside. Unless they get a rich dietary source of exogenous lysine, supplied by us in tablet form, they'll go into a coma within 12 hours and expire. 
These animals are genetically engineered to be unable to survive in the real world. They can only live here in Jurassic Park. They're not free at all. They're essentially our prisoners. And then here we go. And this is quite important, uh, a chart that shows how all of the animals tally up. And I used that as well to refer back to dinosaur names when I was writing my parody song, uh, Jurassic Park Life, for again, for Lord Lack Literature and Madam Media. I thought this was amusing too, so he's talking about the bugs in the system, it says. In fact, the bug list now ran to more than 130 items and included many odd aspects. For example, the animal feeding program reset itself every 12 hours, not every 24 hours, and would not record feedings on Sundays. As a result, the staff could not accurately measure how much the animals were eating. The security system, which controlled all the security card operated doors, cut out whenever main power was lost, and did not come back on with auxiliary power. The security program only ran with main power. The physical conservation program, intended to dim lights after 10pm, only worked on alternate days of the week. The automated faecal analysis, called Autopoop, designed to check for parasites in the animal's stools, invariably recorded all specimens as having the parasite Phagosotamum venulosum, although none did. The program then automatically dispensed medication into the animal's food. If the handlers dumped the medicine out of the hoppers to prevent its being dispensed, an alarm sounded which could not be turned off. And I also thought it was quite quaint. He had to commandeer all of the telephone lines on the island to transfer data to people through like the old dial-up internet connection. And I thought this was interesting, they're talking about the T-Rexes now and somebody says, uh, you often see the little one down in the lagoon. The lagoon's stuck so we have fish in there. The little one has learned to catch the fish. Interesting how he does it. He doesn't use his hands, but he ducks his whole head under the water, like a bird. We have a reference here, it says uh, DNA was such a large molecule that each species required 10 gigabytes of optical disk space to store details of all the iterations. He was going to have to check all 15 species. That was a tremendous amount of information to search through. Well, it's 150 gigabytes, which actually isn't that much. It's like searching through a quarter of my com no, it's like searching through like an eighth of my computer's current hard drive space. We have uh, one of the little girls, she says, uh, there's aminals out there. And that, um, that throws one of the characters for a second, he says, she hadn't said animals for years. Which I think is great, it shows like, how, how they revert back to this innocent state, I guess, in the face of threat. I like this conversation between Tim and Dr. Grant, so Tim says, Then who are you going to marry? I don't think I'm going to marry anybody, Grant said. Me neither, Tim said. And here we get, um, Malcolm goes on a ramp, which I'm going to read out, but I very much think this is a stand-in, like he's using Malcolm as a stand-in for his own opinions on the matter. I'll tell you the problem with engineers and scientists. Scientists have an elaborate line of bullshit about how they're seeking to know the truth about nature, which is true, but that's not what drives them. Nobody is driven by, ex nobody is driven by abstractions like seeking truth. Scientists are actually preoccupied with accomplishment, so they're focused on whether they can do something. They never stop to ask if they should do something. They conveniently define such considerations as pointless. If they don't do it, someone else will. Discovery, they believe, is inevitable. So they just try to do it first. That's the game in science. Even pure scientific discovery is an aggressive, penetrative act. It takes big equipment, and it literally changes the world afterward. Particle, acceler particle accelerators scar the land and leave radioactive byproducts. Astronauts leave trash on the moon. There is always some proof that scientists were there, making their discoveries. Discovery is always a rape of the natural world. Always. The scientists want it that way. They have to stick their instruments in. They have to leave their mark. They can't just watch. They can't just appreciate. They can't just fit into the natural order. They have to make something unnatural happen. That is the scientist's job. And now we have whole, so and now we have whole societies that try to be scientific. Interesting little rant. I don't know how much I agree with it. but And then we see a young male velociraptor. And this is significant because the park itself only bred females. And they were supposed to be um, like have been neutralized as well. So the fact that there's a young male in the wild means it was born recently. Even though it shouldn't have been born recently. And also is born naturally as opposed to through, through the park. And then uh, Muldoon says here, The thing about these damn dinos is that they have distributed nervous systems. They don't die fast, even with a direct hit to the brain. And they're built solidly, their ribs make a shot to the heart dicey, and they're difficult to cripple in the legs or hindquarters. Slow bleeders, slow to die. He was opening the cylinders one after another and dropping in the canisters. And um, I think what's interesting about this book in general is it kind of keeps on raising the stakes of how much of a threat the dinosaurs are. So they're kind of moving faster than they should be and stuff, so there's an extra element of the scare there. Then obviously the stakes are increased when it seems as though all actually maybe they can reproduce because of the implications of that. And so we have another one of Malcolm's rants here. He says, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Most kinds of power require a substantial sacrifice by whoever wants the power. 
There is an apprenticeship, a discipline lasting many years. Whatever kind of power you want, president of the company, black belt in karate, spiritual guru, whatever it is you seek, you have to put in the time, the practice, the effort. You must give up a lot to get it. It has to be very important to you, and once you've attained it, it is your power. It can't be given away. It resides in you. It is literally the result of your discipline. Now, what is interesting about this process is that by the time someone has acquired the ability to kill with his bare hands, he is also matured to the point where he won't use it unwisely. So that kind of power has a built-in control. The discipline of getting the power changes you so that you won't abuse it. But scientific power is like inherited wealth, attained without discipline. You read what others have done and you take the first step. You can do it very young. You can make progress very fast. There is no discipline lasting many decades. There is no mastery. Old scientists are ignored. There is no humility before nature. There is only a get rich quick, make a name for yourself fast philosophy. Cheat, lie, falsify, it doesn't matter. Not to you or to your colleagues. No one will criticize you. No one has any standards. They're all trying to do the same thing, to do something big and do it fast. And because you can stand on the shoulders of giants, you can accomplish something quickly. You don't even know exactly what you've done, but already you have reported it, painted it, and sold it. And the buyer will have even less discipline than you. The buyer simply purchases the power, like any commodity. The buyer doesn't even conceive that any discipline might be necessary. So we get this point where Dr. Grant's off to try and fix the power supply, and Wu's talking to him on the radio, and he goes, uh, Now straight ahead of you should be two large yellow tanks that are marked flammable. They say inflammable, and then something underneath in Spanish. That is the kind of pedantism that I approve of. Thought this dated it a bit, it gets a... It was a touch screen! Of course he thought he had touched the screen. It was a touch screen. The red lights around the edges must be infrared sensors. Tim had never seen such a screen, but he'd read about them in magazines. And nowadays, you use them every day to do your self-shopping. Or to use your phone. So here we get uh, another bit of Malcolm doing, I guess, again, I guess what is uh, Michael Crichton's own opinions and, and beliefs. But he says, uh, let me tell you about our planet. Our planet is four and a half billion years old. There has been life on this planet for nearly that long. 3.8 billion years, the first bacteria, and later, the first multicellular animals, then the first complex creatures in the sea on the land. Then the great sweeping ages of animals, the amphibians, the dinosaurs, the mammals, each lasting millions upon millions of years. Great dynasties of creatures arising, flourishing, dying away. All this happening against a background of continuous and violent upheaval, mountain ranges thrust up and eroded away, cometary impacts, volcanic eruptions, oceans rising and falling. Whole continents moving, endless constant and violent change. Even today, the greatest geographical feature on the planet comes from two great continents colliding, buckling to make the Himalayan mountain range over millions of years. The planet has survived everything in its time. It will certainly survive us. Which is sort of true and is sort of not true. So yeah, that's about all I have to say about um, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. I mean, I'm not one of those people who's like re raised religiously on the movie, so I've seen it like twice or something, but I couldn't particularly remember it in detail. Which was cool, because that meant that I kind of imagined the characters for myself, you know? Um, it was a bit slow paced at times, it kind of went really slowly for the first half and then really quickly for the second half, which was a bit odd. Um, but I imagine it was pretty, pretty good for its time. I will be reading more Michael Crichton. I would give this a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5, not quite a 4 out of 5. And in the grand scheme of things, I've been kind of describing it as better than Jaws. Um, but not as good as uh, The Rats by James Herbert. So, yeah, there we have it. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.